Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for HB Virtual Class. Today, we're going to be doing some giftable wines. My name is Cody Pennington. I will be hosting you this evening. I'm a beer and wine manager at the New Braunfels 3 Plus location. And I'm joined today by Chef Scott, the always humble and awesome Chef Scott. He will be acting as moderator today. Any questions you may have, please feel free to shoot them over. We will be uh, happy to answer them as best we can. Chef Scott, always good to see you again, my friend. Thanks for having me, Cody. I'm excited. Before you start, uh, I have to call out. I need you to brag about yourself for a second because you, have, you hold two very specialized certifications, and I want the folks at home to know exactly who they're talking to. They are talking to a bona fide expert. So will you share a little bit about your, uh, your, your background and then some of your, uh, your certifications that, that make this class uh, even better? Absolutely, sir. Again, like Chef Scott said, uh, I am very humble and awesome, as he is as well. Uh, so I <laughs> yeah, have we the are. two certifications I have with HEB um, and for the world of alcohol. I'm a level one Cicerone, which is essentially a beer steward, a beer server, if you will. Uh, essentially a, on the path to becoming a master Cicerone. I um, would love to get to that level, although I don't think I can actually make level four uh, yet. Uh, but in training to do level two hopefully next year, uh, COVID set a few things back this year. Uh, so level one for the Cicerone, and I'm a level two for the WeSet. The WeSet is essentially a sommelier type program based out of the UK. Uh, HEB was very uh, generous in offering that to uh, the beer and wine managers who wanted to take part in it. So currently level two, I'd love to take my training for level three as well. I know there are only a few in HEB, but HEB is an awesome company and they're happy to uh, help us with our education and uh, help further us with our careers as well. So I love it. very Invest. generous on their so, part. So yeah, if you have questions for Cody, you can post them in the uh, question and answer, just like you said, or in the chat, and we'll try to get to those as fast as we can. But yeah, I'm excited. All right, let's do oh, this. Awesome. We are in for a great class today. We have four fantastic wines available at HEB. We're gonna be doing an amazing Chardonnay, Kendall Jackson's Appalachian series. That of Mendocino, we'll be talking about that one first. Next will be our Becker Iconoclast Barrel Select Cabernet out of the High Plains of Texas. Number three is going to be a new favorite for every one of y'all. It is going to be our Decoy Limited Series Cabernet. It'll be the middle ground now that it has created itself uh, between normal Decoy Cabernet out of Sonoma. This one will be the Napa Valley version. And of course, Duckhorn is the uh, the big Ferrari of that uh, lineup. That is their flagship wine. So it is a series, and they have now created a middle position which is a fantastic wine. I got to try it last night. Super good, very enjoyable. Last but not least will be our Prima Mazo Gold. That will be a Moscato, but a sparkling Moscato. So a little bit of something for everybody in that one. Uh, sweet, but bubbly at the same time. So all good things. Uh, sweet. Well, we're going to get started. Chef Scott, any questions along the way? Feel, feel free to uh, shoot Yeah, and to actually me. we have a question, our first question from Callie. Uh, Callie's excited. She wants to know what makes, she's always wondered what makes something buttery with Chardonnay. And you and I were just talking about this before we started about the malactic fermentation and everything. Will you kind of take folks through like what is a Chardonnay grape? What are the character profiles? And then what, and then explain, because there's a million different ways they can age it and flavor these things, right? Yes, indeed. Chardonnay is a, it's a fantastic grape. Uh, you know, world renowned. Everybody does their own version of Chardonnay, it seems like these days. But uh, Chardonnay is actually a very easy grape to manipulate. Uh, you're able to hide behind French oak, American oak. Uh, we have people doing them in stainless steel casts. They're even doing them in concrete. Uh, bats now, so pretty much not hiding behind anything. They're kind of letting the wine speak for itself. Uh, so the malolactic fermentation is going to be uh, lined up with the buttery, creamy feel that a Chardonnay would give you. So this particular wine is actually a nice blend of the apples and tropical fruit notes and the buttery, rich, creamy quality as well. So it's kind of a best of both worlds, a wine that pretty much everyone should enjoy. I like it. So, the ma so when you say the malolactic fermentation, they're actually adding malic acid which is like, so what, what point do they add that to the wine to make it, to give it that like creamy quality? Like what, what is that? I believe it's uh, uh, between the, uh, the barrel selection. Uh, if they're gonna do apple, excuse me, if they're going to do uh, French oak or American oak, I believe they just sort of add it in. Um, I guess kind of depends on when they want to add it in there for how right. much creaminess they really want to add to it. Uh, but yeah, essentially a, a buttery Chardonnay is gonna be great for your uh, Alaskan king crab or your uh, Australian lobster tail, something like that. Something that's already buttery and creamy. You're adding that to it, so it just kind of complements it and just kind of makes it. it a little richer and, you know, good for the soul, if you could say that. So, yeah, so the first wine we'll be doing right here is the Kendall Jackson, again, Appalachian from Mendocino. Mendocino is going to be the Pacific Northwest part of California. So, Kendall Jackson, regular Chardonnay, is actually the number one Chardonnay in America and has been for years and years and years. So, this is actually a... Uh, it's going to take a little bit of the fruit notes that normal Chardonnay has, but then adds that, again, that malolactic creamy feel, so it kind of balances it out. 
So great food wine. And Cody, I'll take mine in a sippy cup if you don't mind. Sippy cup, yes. Straw or no straw this time? <laughs> no straw. No straw. It's Thursday. We're all becoming adults today. This is, this is fantastic. <laughs> So uh, again, the Chardonnay is, is, uh, is growing on me pretty quickly. I personally wasn't a huge Chardonnay fan, but uh, this is one that you, like I said, you could pretty much have any time. Uh, I chose some, uh, some crackers over here, a nice assortment in Central Market provided. You can buy these at HEB as well. But uh, charcuterie board is something you can always throw together pretty quickly and look like an all-star. A uh, couple of crackers, you can always throw a little bit of chocolates in there as well, meats, any kind of deli items, fruits, nuts. You can cheat a little bit and just throw some trail mix in there as well. Not a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, this is a very nice, easy drinking Chardonnay. Uh, one of those wines, again, that you can just sort of open any time. You don't really need food with it, but it yeah, always goes good, down good as an appetizer. Well. So we talk about giftables, because this class is all about some giftables and some great wine knowledge and some great stuff. Like if, if you were going to take, so it's your first time hosting or your first time, you know, kind of taking something over. If you're going to do Chardonnay is your, your thing of choice because, you know, it pairs well with whatever. Like what, what, what are some pointers as far as like what? You know, you said the crackers. What are some other things, like, when you talk about, like, if I'm gifting wine, like, what's the appropriate way to gift wine? Like, what do you, like, do you bring one sure, bottle, sure. two uh, bottles? What do you, do you give it a special bag? Do you put it in wine court? I mean, like, what, what do you, what, what, how can we set us up for success? Uh, so Chardonnay uh, should be, uh, I mean, depending on how much you like the people, if you're in trouble with them or not. Uh, Chardonnay, uh, being a white wine, you can easily have it chilled and gain those extra gold star points and giving it to the guests. But uh, just a typical wine bag would be good. You can always, again, present it with a, uh, with a, a little thing of crackers, something like this, or some fruits. Um, again, it, it's going to make you a superstar just because it, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, but yeah, Chardonnay is a great, uh, great gift for the holidays. We don't really get super duper cold winters over here. So uh, it's kind of a gift that you can kind of give year round, to be honest with you. Right, we've got a question from Ashley who, who's asking, what's the best wine for cooking? Do you have a special one you like to use? What's your preference as far as? So yes, the, uh, the question I get quite often in the wine department is, uh, I need some wine to go with cooking. And uh, you know what wine should I choose? And my question right off the bat is going to be a red or a white. In other words, what dish are we actually cooking today? Uh, Chardonnay is something I usually gravitate towards. Uh, Pinot Grigio is always going to have more of a crisp acidity kind of thing. So if you have a dish that has uh, maybe a little more of that richness, uh, even a risotto, something like that, a Pinot Grigio, that little bit of acidity, that crispness should actually cut through some of the cream sauce. Uh, so you can always zing that in there. But a Chardonnay is a it's a fail safe. It's a good, um, good one to go with. Most definitely. Uh, like and if that. you ever look in the wine department, uh, we do have those little uh, black box and Boda box uh, mini cartons of wine. It's about 500 milliliters. It's two full cups of cooking wine. They, uh, it is actually very drinkable wine as well. They've won numerous gold medals. But uh, yeah, if you don't want to fully commit to getting a full bottle of wine, you just need a cup or two a little bit. Why buy a whole bottle? Easily get one of those. So, so we talk, that's a good point, Cody. So talk a little bit about like the, the box wines we think. I think they have a certain like Thing associated with them, and I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a good stigma, bad stigma, but there's usually so. Can you talk about because there's a lot of those wines that have actually won awards and those things. Like, so, so give us the like, is it do they last longer? Are they just as good as bottle wines from the same regions? Like, give us a little. Yes, little. they are. Uh, so the the box wines, uh, I think a lot of people probably wanted to hate them because they're like, there's no way that's going to be good. <laughs> but uh, they've actually won a lot of awards, like like I said in uh, in blind tastings. Uh, the beautiful thing about those box wines, especially if you cook with wine a lot, those things will stay fresh up to six weeks. Open that thing up, pour it the oxygen, it's not able to get to the wine because of the spout that comes with it. So you can leave that thing in your fridge for a while. A couple of things here or there, you can always get a glass of it as well. Again, it is definitely a drinkable wine. But uh, yeah, like I said, if you're cooking with wine a lot, you don't want to splurge on getting a bottle every time, every time you cook something. I like it. Say so go. Do not be don't, don't be scared, in other words. So this first wine, uh, definitely a... Uh, Big on the pear and apple type notes up front. Uh, maybe light honeysuckle in there as well. It definitely, definitely has that kind of, I don't want to say creaminess, but smooth quality to it. So I'll try this out. Uh, Denny asked a really good question. Are we really supposed to let the wine sit and breathe after opening, or can we get right to serving? I know you're going to talk a little bit about red wines as well and talk about breathing and decanting. Mm -hmm. So Denny, we may put a fork in that. He's going to he may come back to that. So we'll hold on to that question because there's, there's more to unpack with that. Most definitely. Uh, yeah, so again, we sell a ton of Chardonnay. Um, the younger brother of this being Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, um, being world renowned, this will be a step up from that. But again, uh, that little bit of extra complexity that comes with this one, I think will be, a, will be a crowd favorite. Everyone seems to like this one that I've shown it to so far. So great wine, and it's a primo pick as well. So definitely something to keep on your radar. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. I'm a big fan of Chardonnay, Cody. I'm not going to lie to you. It's I'm usually a big the fan of Sauvignon starter Blancs, wine. But yes, we'll... Uh, <laughs> We'll definitely, uh, definitely have to get Chardonnay one of these days. All right, so now we're getting serious. I see you're going to a bigger glass. 
Yes, and indeed. And what is the, so, so if somebody focuses at home, want to do the, if they want to copy the exact same thing you're doing, are these glasses available at HEB? These are definitely available at HEB. So they used to be part of the kitchen and table lineup. So they have, uh, I believe, four different options. Uh, we do have a white wine right here for you, a white wine glass, a uh, red wine glass, a Pinot Noir glass, um, or a burgundy glass as well, if you will. Uh, by the way, fun fact for you, if you find a cooking recipe that says a burgundy wine, burgundy, the two famous grapes or varietals, will be Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So if you see a red burgundy, they're talking about Pinot Noir. So oh, fun like little fact that. for you. There you go. But yeah, these are fantastic. Great price point as well. If you want to add an extra gift, that's just something to, you know, Gain extra there credit go. points. There's your gift table. You bring the bottle of wine over, and, in, and if you want to drink out of the special glass, you gift them with two of the glasses you want to drink out of. There you go. Most definitely. Easy <laughs> stuff. Uh, so we are, yes, moving on to the red wine glass. Wine number two is going to be Becker Vineyard Iconoclast Barrel Select Series. This is a special blend that HCB uh, was able to uh, speak with Becker on and get them to make a special bottle just for us. So we are first to market with this one, but it is a fantastic product. I personally was not a huge Texas wine fan. I'm growing up here in San Antonio. I get that quite often with customers. They want a good Texas wine. Uh, Texas, in a way, um, really has been planting a lot of grapes in a lot of areas. We're trying to find our voice, to be totally honest with you. Uh, there are some wines that work here and some that don't, but you know that's part of the trial and error of, uh, of growing wine. Uh, so this particular wine will come from the Texas High Plains. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that's at, if you know where Midland is at, which is you know roughly center, maybe a little higher up, uh, that will be going uh, up towards, oh, excuse me, not Odessa, uh, up towards Amarillo. That's kind of the strip of High Plains. It's uh, obviously a little farther north, so the wine reacts a little better as far as growing it. Now, it's still, I wouldn't plant a Pinot Noir or anything like that up there. But uh, why, why, you said you talk about Pinot Noir, which I like. I love you talking about the terroir of, tech and of Texas and the different grape varietals. So explain a little bit, like, why, why would Pinot Noir not work as well in Texas? So Pinot Noir is uh, essentially going to be almost the opposite of a Cabernet without it being actually sweet. Uh, Pinot Noir uh, will be more thin skin, very finicky, very fickle. It doesn't like too hot, doesn't like too cold. Um, so Texas, to be quite honest, is just, just too hot for, for Pinot Noir. Uh, again, I've, I've seen people try Pinot Noir and I, I applaud them for trying it, but uh, <laughs> in my opinion, I'm not quite there yet with them. I think but, I share uh, that same opinion. <laughs> they're, they're, they're going for it. Um, so uh, Cabernet actually goes pretty decent in Texas. Uh, another grape is actually be Tempranillo. Uh, if you're not familiar with Tempranillo, originates more in the Spanish area. We are on pretty much the same latitude as Spain would be. So those uh, spicier, acidic type notes uh, essentially will make it almost a bigger brother to like a Pinot Noir. So a little more full bodied, but again, that acidic value kind of adds that little extra zip to it. So think more of the, your red fruits, your cranberries, your raspberries. Uh, when I talk about acidity with customers, I, uh, the best way I describe it is saying if you bite into a raspberry or a cranberry, you're going to get that tartness just for a second up front, totally natural, but then the second bite you have is going to have those fruit qualities come out. That's kind of how I feel about Tempranillos and uh, wines that have that little bit of the acidic punch in the face up front. Totally natural, but acidity will always hit your tongue first, and then the sweet factor will slowly come in there as well. All those fruit notes open up yeah. very nicely. I like and it. They're good, they're good food wines, typically, that. right? Those, some of those wines, Tempranillo is going to be good food wines. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, again, that's another great item to, uh, to add on to. Um, you know, we're starting to get more into the red wine, excuse me, the red meats, things like that. But, uh, yeah, again, if you're doing a heavy cream sauce on top, of a, on top of a steak, if you're doing a cognac pepper cream sauce, or you're doing a Bordelais sauce, something like that, that acidity will cut through the cream sauce and complement the dish without overpowering it. I got a couple questions for you here. For we, so I've got, Lauren, I've got a question from Lauren and Jackie, two separate questions. When it comes to red wine, as we're in right now, what temperatures should you keep red wine at and should you refrigerate it? I refrigerate mine. That may be the wrong thing to do, but I like it cool. I like so, it cool. Uh, so having the, uh, the hospitality restaurant background, uh, we did keep our wine, uh, red wines, uh, right around 57 degrees. Now, granted, when you do bring it out, that's a little warmer than a refrigerator would be. Basically, when you refrigerate something like that, you are kind of restricting or pulling the fruit notes back. Uh, but as the bottle opens up, you're really, you're really getting to experience those fruit notes slowly but surely will start coming out. So this particular one, I got red fruits up front, again, the raspberry, the cranberry notes, but slowly but surely those blackberry, plum, boysenberry notes start coming out and you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is evening out. It's, uh, it's not in one lane or the other. It's like, oh, okay, now we're kind of in the middle. Uh, so you're kind of playing the game with acids and tannins and this is a good example of getting one side and then the other side joins it and then it's kind of a beautiful thing. Um, I like, I so like this, that. Jack, yes, uh, Jackie's question was, uh, why do we use different wine glasses, red wine, champagne? I do it, but what's the rationale? Sure. Uh, so red wine, you're essentially trying to get more oxygen to the wine itself. Uh, 
Pinot Noir, if you ever see a Pinot Noir glass at a fancy restaurant, uh, would generally be a larger tulip glass. Uh, you're, again, just trying to add more oxygen to it. Uh, you see a lot of people, or you may do this yourself, and that's absolutely acceptable, is spinning the wine glass around, you're swirling it. It's not just to be pretentious, it's also to, uh, to actually add oxygen to the wine itself. You're really opening up, all those fruit notes again start coming out, they're in your face. Uh, yeah, essentially that's, that's what the wine wants to do. It's been, it's been bottled a few years beforehand, obviously, if you ever see the vintage on here, we're talking at least two or three years old for the most part, just to start with. So now that it's open, the oxygen's hitting it, it's becoming alive, those notes start coming out. Um, Tasting note on wine though, once you do open a bottle of wine, the clock is clicking. So you are essentially playing a time game and you're wanting to consume it before it, uh, before it makes itself into vinegar. Uh, so good note that I tell most customers that just because you open a bottle of wine, um, you know, don't have to drink it right away, but again, the clock is ticking. I would say no more than three, maybe five days op after you open a bottle of wine. Uh, when you open a bottle of wine, the, the idea of course should be that you're going to be consuming it pretty quickly. Uh, now, if you do know that you're not going to be um, drinking the whole bottle that evening, best thing to possibly do is actually open it up, pour yourself a glass or two for the, for the spouse, um, corking the bottle and actually putting it in the refrigerator. Even if it's a bottle of red wine, corking it, throw it in the refrigerator actually stops the oxidation process and might buy you a little extra time. Uh, I have customers all the time that ask me, I've opened a bottle of wine a week or two ago, is it still good? Um, <laughs> I would say no. Uh, you're essentially playing with, am I going to get sick or not? Maybe for a salad dressing. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, if you say it for salad dressing, you might, you might do that. Um, but yeah, uh, again, the mindset should be, let's go ahead and drink it that we opened it. I like it. While you're on Texas wines, Jeanette wanted to know, what are your top picks for Texas wines? And then I have another question after that. Sure thing. Um, so uh, again, I think as shotgun blasts happen between what varietals are actually making their way here, uh, Becker is the number one selling uh, HB. Um, wine. Uh, McPherson uh, is doing a very nice beignet. Uh, we do have some pretty nice uh, sweeter wines. Again, I'm not a personally a sweet wine fan, but some Riesling, some uh, Lost Maples has been playing with uh, Muscat grapes. Their Muscat Canelli is uh, essentially sweeter. Those rosés actually do very nicely in the summertime. Um, I can open up and have a glass and not feel like, oh, that's, that's too sweet. It's just, it's nice, refreshing. Right. Uh, but yeah, I'd probably have to say between Becker and yeah, the McPherson uh, is probably my, one of my go-tos. So. There you go. Um, okay, so I have another question. So, uh, Joe asks, Cody, what do I do if I break, I break a cork while I'm opening it? I have, I would just take out my sword and I do the skimter thing, you know, yes. like they do because I'm fancy like that, but that may not be everybody's, <laughs> if you, I don't do that. If I'm you kidding. don't have a sword, hatchet, axe, chainsaw, <laughs> insert other sharp implement, uh, best thing to actually do, and I've done this several times myself, is actually go ahead and bite in the bullet and push the cork all the way down. By that point, the cork will be in the bottle itself. If you're not able to try and turn around and save it, just go ahead and put it down. If you have a cheesecloth or some sort of filter of some sort, you can put that over your glass, go ahead and pour it through there. The cork will get stuck in there and the cheesecloth itself, that way you won't actually get it in the glass. Um, again, waiting tables, corks break sometimes. That's essentially saying that wine has not been in contact with the cork uh, for a long enough period of time to keep the cork moist, so it does kind of crumble on you. You also see this in really old wines as well. Um, it's, it's a shame, but uh, that's, kind of the name of the game. We do see a lot more wines that are going to the screw caps now. Screw caps have actually come miles and miles uh, away from there where they first started. So the chance of you getting a corked wine with a screw cap is extremely low now. So more and more wineries are actually turning to cork, uh, excuse me, to screw caps instead of corks. That's a great tip. I like that. So wine number two right here for you. So I'm like you, Cody. I, I you know, I, I moved uh, to Texas from California, and so I have a, I have a certain, I, I guess when you start drinking, it seems to me whatever wine you start drinking or whatever wine you kind of are, you know, cut your teeth on are the wines you kind of tend to stay with. So like for those people that have only drank, I know we'll get into sweets, but like how do you kind of, how do you train people to go from like a sweet wine or like, hey, I'm used to drinking this wine. How do you train them to kind of go up and drink like a red like this or a, or a cab or a pinot? What's the... Yes, indeed. Uh, excellent question. Um, honestly, baby steps, uh, the best way of saying it. Uh, you don't want to shock someone and go from something sweet to something more medium or full body like a Cabernet or a Zinfandel, something like that. It might be just a little too much. Uh, so the best way to introduce people to wine is honestly through sweet wines. And with wine growing more and more all the time, this is just a great way to ease them into it. I generally go to a Riesling or even maybe a... Uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc uh, something I personally like. Um, 
you're essentially getting a ton of the tropical fruit notes. So your, your mango, papaya, passion fruit, pineapple, notes like that are just a good way to ease them into it. You're not trying to intimidate somebody. You're just doing one of those like, here, try this and, uh, you know, I like try it. something new, get them out of their comfort zone a little bit, but kind of ease them into the world of wine. You'll build your way up to uh, more full-bodied wines, which would be like a Cabernet, something like that. So what I'm hearing is you just need to drink more wine, try more and more wine, and then you just baby steps. Baby, baby steps, yeah. You don't want to scare people. Uh, everybody's tastes are going to be a little bit different, so what we don't want to do again is be like, no, you should be at this level. It's like, well, let's, let's, <laughs> you know, let's make it to first base, second base, third base before we just go, I hit home runs. You should hit home runs too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, it, and the world of wine is beautiful. Uh, again, stuff is always coming out. Uh, new wines, new wineries are opening, so it's just always something new to, to play with. It. All right, you go on to the next one. So uh, while you're pouring that one, getting that one ready, we had a, Victoria, you may have missed the, she said, what about box, box wine? She has an LOL in there, but we had a, we had a serious moment about box wine. We, there's a lot of awards being won by a lot of the box wine. So, um, on everybody who's familiar with the slap a bag, the, 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 the box wine. Good for the river. But it's like, yeah. but it is like, there are so many, like you said, so Victoria, like is, in, in all kidding aside, there is a market for it because Cody was saying that they can last up to six weeks yes, in refrigeration because they're not being open. They're completely vacuum sealed, which is great. So, and a lot of them are really fantastic as far as like most people would kind of go, you know, can I cook with this? Can I, I bring it to a party or whatever? But it is, it can be your everyday drinking wine based on the fact that it doesn't go bad. It won't turn to vinegar on you. So it's a great thing. And we also had Denny wanted to know, what about your favorite, what's your favorite Zinfandel? Favorite Zinfandel? Uh, ooh, uh, I would probably have to go with the Saldo. Uh, it's done with the Prisoner Wine Company. Phenomenal wine, about $22 or so at H&B. Uh, if you can find it, it's... It's a very simple label. It's essentially a black bottle with a red um, sticker note that just pretty much spells out in white letter solid. It's, it's very unassuming, but it is, it's fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, dark, rich, inky fruit. Just, Zinfandels oh, I'm are a great sucker for, for Zinfandels sometimes. Like, Zinfandels are great, like, especially in Texas, for like barbecuing, right? They're like a good backyard wine. They're kind of not, not like a Cabernet, but they have like, they've got a lot of jammy fruits. They almost can have a little bit of sweetness. I think you were, you were saying earlier, we were talking before... Uh, the class started. There's a lot of those great qualities that, that Zinfandels are very great, just grilling wines. Yeah, they are. They're some of my favorites. So if you uh, if you're watching right now, I am doing. A, I'm actually decanting this bottle right here as well. So this is only a 2018, but uh, essentially when you're adding a decanter, like we talked a little earlier, you're introducing oxygen to the wine. Uh, most people think that uh, by opening a wine uh, a few minutes ahead of time, or even 30 minutes ahead of time, you're you're letting it breathe, as they would say. But when you simply open the wine and leave it like that and let it breathe, you're only introducing about a dime's worth of oxygen to the wine itself, so you aren't really doing as much as you think you're doing. So putting it in a decanter like this, again, you're, you're opening up. The fruits are bursting up. They're going to hit you in the nose much quicker. It's a, it's a nice display piece as well. It kind of makes a statement in a way. Uh, but again, yeah, it just allows those fruit notes just to come right up and, and speak for themselves. So you, you blew my mind earlier because we talked about this because I have a decanter, but I don't ever use it unless I have some really, like, I feel like an aged wine that I do, which is hardly ever. And when you were talking about that with this wine that's under $30, you're typically what I would normally do. I think most people are guilty of you pop the wine that's red and you go, I'm going to let it breathe. I'm going to let it breathe. And all I'm doing is I'm letting it breathe is, is letting it breathe like, <gasps> like pouring it into the decanter will actually allow it to breathe, as you said. And it also uh, would allow me to, to focus on drinking the entire bottle in one, one shot, right? Because you don't want to sure, take it yeah. out of the decanter. That was a joke, but that's, you know, could be, could be, right? It's a weekend. Yes, you can, uh, <laughs> you can, you can, it's a display piece to sell you the best. You can, you can decant any wine. Uh, you're going to get better results with, with red wine. I mean, again, you don't need to decant everything, but you, you can, eh? It's your, your bottle. You, it's your world. You just do and what you want to do. And that decanter is an HB decanter, is that right? This is you an HB that? decanter, also another one of our fantastic kitchen and table products. Um, yeah, again, it's just, it's something to add a little extra. It's the holidays. We, we, we want to not show off, but you want to, you know, really, really appreciate the, you know, the time that we have with, with family. And it's been a tough year. Everybody knows uh, we've, we've been busy as can be with the, with the wine department and everything going on. But uh, it's, it's good to take a step back every once in a while, really appreciate things in life. And, and, you know, we probably, most of us eat dinner in 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. It's, it's a good time to, to take a step back. Let's really enjoy the wine, enjoy the food, taking a bite of something, drinking a little bit of wine, pace yourself, as they would You're say. You're absolutely right. Th there is such a renaissance, I think, coming in. I, I think, you know, because of everything that's gone on in, in 2020, there is a real renaissance to, to just 
slow down and actually pace yourself and, and, and pour the wine in a decanter on a Wednesday or a Thursday. You know, like just slow yourself down, allow the, allow the dinner to take a little longer than 15 minutes, enjoy a little conversation. There's not a lot, uh, you know, that we, we can do right now. So just, you know, sip and enjoy and, uh, and relax and make yourself a good dinner. There's Absolutely. a question from Rochelle about wine pairing with fried turkey. What do you, what do you go with with fried Ooh, turkey? Uh, I like that. Well played. Well played, Michelle. <laughs> uh, so turkey for me is going to be a lot like ham. I would do probably a Pinot Noir. Now the fried part, I, well, I like that bonus question. Uh, I might even flirt with maybe doing an Oregon Pinot Noir. Uh, Oregon Pinot Noirs uh, will be almost the opposite of California. California is going to be your raspberry and strawberry notes up front. Oregon, think a little more reserved, not as much on the fruit forward factors. You kind of get those Bing cherry notes. You actually sometimes can get um, more of the, uh, the forest floor, that rural Burgundian non-fruit descriptor uh, descriptions kind of up front so you're it's there but it's not a fruit bomb it's a little I'm, different but it's it's good yeah. i'm glad you said it this uh a, a lot of people here wine folks like that have your uh pedigree like will say things like forest floor or even things like they throw out barnyard or things like that yes. like these are all things that like well to know like more of an earthiness like we talk yes, about like a wine earthier. like so there's there's so many good descriptive wines mm -hmm. and i love when you throw them out like that because there's a lot of great gems in a in doing that but yeah you're right like so could, like we say, forest floor, does that pair with, you know, like that earthiness, like those kind of wines, like does that lend itself more to cheese, more to whatever? It's like it's a really yes, good... Yes, uh, so yeah, I would, uh, I have a, a personal uh, affinity for the, uh, the boars and cheese. If you've had boars and cheese before, a uh, great product, about $4 or so. It's already got uh, garlics and herbs already in there. But uh, you throw a little bit of that in the dish, a couple of garlic cloves, throw that right in there. My wife and I actually play with slicing a little bit of jalapeno in there as well, a little bit of raspberry, so it's sweet and spicy, not overpowering, go. but just kind of like plays with the taste buds a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun pairing cheeses and wines. Nice. Uh, so this particular wine, again, great product. Uh, Duckhorn's been making wine since 85, so yeah, a good 35 years of doing their, their stuff. Uh, again, great middle ground. Um, just came out this year. We're very proud to have this product. Uh, decoy is always super consistent, so having something like this is a great step up. Same way Kendall Jackson was a step up from regular Kendall Jackson to the Appalachian. This is about, uh, say, $10, $11 more, but I mean, still fantastic. We are also having an amazing Cabernet sale going on right now. Just started yesterday. goes all the way through the 24th. But, um, so yeah. So the Cabernet 15. sale, what do you, what do you, what, what's the percentage off? Like, is yes, there a it'll, be a, it'll be 15% off between 6 and 11 bottles, and if you buy 12 bottles or more, you'll actually be getting 20% off. So, and that's all cabs, that is not just Primo Picks, so. And the more you buy, the better the price goes, and there's no yes. judgment, right? You, you provide a judgment-free zone. Judgment-free zone. That's what I need, Cody. Yes, indeed, uh, yeah, <laughs> up to a thousand bottles, just go crazy. Again, great gifts, nobody's gonna be upset if you give them a bottle of wine for Christmas. It's, uh, it's just kind of a quick, easy gift at any time. So this it. particular wine, uh, more full-bodied, uh, darker, richer, blackberry, boysenberry, like we talked about, those plum notes. Um, blueberries and chocolate. So this one uh, we were playing with a little bit. Uh, obviously, we always want to talk about doing red wine, excuse me, red wine with red meats. But throwing a little bit of chocolate in there is actually a good way to kind of end the meal. Uh, it's not doing a full heavy dessert at the end of it. But uh, yeah, if you're going to open up that bottle to can't the whole thing, say you happen to finish your meat, what are we going to do with the wine? Of course, you're going to drink it. We might as well throw a little bit of something dessert style in there that's not going to be, again, super overpowering. But uh, yeah, it, again, it really complements it. There's our flavors of cocoa or chocolate already in here with the blueberry flute. So you're essentially making so I love the that. perfect combination. Yeah. You're, you're adding value to the meal by going like, hey, we're not just going to drink this. And when it's done, you just go, that's all we're going to do. Like you can move on to something and go, hey, we're going to have a nice little you know, finish to the dinner. Most definitely, that goes yeah. great. And you just keep the, the wine keeps on going. Yeah. Not it. a ton of sugar in this stuff either. So I mean, it's an easy dish yeah like it right and last but not least last but not least this is definitely the showstopper there's definitely a out of all the wines you've got sitting up there there's one that the eye just goes to and that's this dazzling gold bottle <laughs> bam so this is going to be a prima mazo gold i've always said it looks like a drinking trophy it is a showstopper it makes a uh, definitely makes a a statement uh Bright, beautiful gold bottle. So if you're familiar with our Prima Mazo, we have a blue labeled one. This is essentially, again, being a bigger brother of that one. So a lot more bubbles to this one. Drinks almost like a, a sparkling champagne. There's a lot of effervescence, a lot of bubbles in there. But in a way, those bubbles actually calm the Moscato's sweetness down. Moscato will be made from the Muscat grape. So Piedmont, Italy is northwest part of Italy. That's kind of what they specialize in. Again, I'm not a sweet wine fanatic, but it's not bad to have a glass every once in a while. 
great for uh, great for parties, great for uh, uh, after dinner. This is essentially a dessert in a glass, if you will. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about pairing as well. So this one, again, I don't know if I would do a really heavy dessert with it. I might flirt with maybe a creme brulee, maybe even like a key lime pie. The apple, peach, pear, apricot notes that are already prevalent in this kind of dictates that you don't need something really big and chocolatey, although maybe a chocolate mousse, something a little lighter, a little fluffier. I wouldn't be against doing this with maybe an Asian-inspired dish. Uh, Thai, Vietnamese, Vietnamese, something that has a little bit of spice in it. That little bit of sweetness should calm that down, kind of balance it out. I like so that, if you yeah. really had to pair of uh, food with it, I'd probably do something like that. So again, uh, we, have a, we have a question from sure. Cole. Uh, he's asking, what types of cheese, fruits, et cetera, would you pair with the different wines in terms of balancing the charcuterie board depending on the wine you're serving, which is great. And Cole, if you were around for uh, the, the great wine and cheese class that Charlotte and Bernice put on, there's a lot of great uh, stuff from that. But we didn't have our wine expert, Cody. So maybe Cody, you could kind of talk a little bit about like when you're doing, even just if it's your personal, like when I do a charcuterie board, I like to use X with, with Y kind of a thing. Sure, uh, again, uh Chardonnay bubbles honestly go with everything. You can easily throw this with um, uh, with oysters or something like that. Bubbles are a fail safe. You're always going to look like a hero. Uh, there's some fantastic uh, rosé bubbles as well. Sparkling wines that have rosé, um, or excuse me, rosé sparkling wine. Um, so for me, an assortment of cheeses, assortment of crackers. You're you're kind of providing that variety, so everybody kind of finds a little bit of what they're looking for. But you can't go wrong with bubbles. Um, yeah, I've never met anybody that's like, I don't like bubbles with <laughs> charcuterie. It's a, and again, it's something that you can open up uh, post-COVID, of course. Uh, for friends and family, open up that bottle of champagne in the beginning. It's not bad to start a meal with bubbles. Prosecco is fantastic for that. We sell a ton of La Marca. That's a very easy product to open up any time. We're really looking for wines that anybody can open at almost any time and enjoy. You don't need a special occasion to open bubbles. You, you really don't, although like we're getting that. very close to, to Christmas and New Year's, so that is the time to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, bubbles this, for every occasion. We talked. We were talking a little about Meal Simple earlier before we got on the the, the Zoom. But the uh, there's you had a great Meal Simple, which I want you to go back to to talk about with your decoy. And we have I know uh, as everybody shops at their local HEBs, there's a ton of if you've seen the value added cut fruit, which is all the fruit we've taken all the hard work out of, like mm -hmm. trying to cut the strawberries and blueberries. We paired all those things with like coconut, blueberries, whatever. This wine that you're serving here, I think, would be great to just even if it's a couple tablespoons over the obviously not for the kids, uh, yeah. but pour it over the fruit and just have this lightly sweet kind of syrup that kind of gets mixed with it would be a great sure. way to kind of also use some of that as well. Absolutely. Uh, another good one is uh, during the summertime, uh, I'm not again throwing a bag of frozen, uh, frozen fruit in here as well. Uh, Central Market has got a ton of mixed berries. Throw that in there, it kind of acts as an ice cube, keeps it cold, and again, you're really you just go. putting fruit into wine. So Genius. that's doing what uh, to do. Jackie would like to know, Cody, your favorite bubbly rosé before we go. I know we got a couple more minutes. Favorite bubbly rosé, um, so Frigine uh, is a cava from Spain, and cava is essentially going to be a champagne but from Spain, a sparkling wine. So they have a fantastic, uh, fantastic brut rosé, uh, 1998, right around that price point. Um, so effervescent, the bubbles generally knock down the fruit flavors, so you still kind of get that raspberry strawberry hint to it, but fantastic. It looks like a chandelier bottle. Um, everybody that sees that bottle, it's, it's a very easy choice. So if you have the people that love sweet wine, boom right there, otherwise that Frigine. Moscato Brut, both Primo Pick, both fantastic items, great values. Just love it. Solid all the way around. Cody, you're the man. I love all that. That's good information. I, I got am, an awesome I'm, job. I've really done a I bunch of to, notes. Get to talk uh, wine with people all day, so it's <laughs> is a lot of fun. Um, let's see what else. What else? Uh, yeah. Uh, as far as pairings, uh, some other stuff. Uh, decoy for me was a little more of the uh, maybe a ribeye or even like an Australian lamb, something like that. For the Becker, I've actually had this before, is going to be the um, Meal Simple. It's a USDA Prime New York Strip. So Becker, again, it's not, a, it's not super full body, but it's not light either. It's kind of that medium body. So that New York Strip is essentially going to be a beautiful middle ground between a filet mignon and a ribeye. That marble ice strip on the outside kind of allows the wine to kind of break it down, but still kind of smooth it out at the same time. So it's a... Uh, there's so many fantastic items in the Primo Pick Love items. That. So, uh, a, by the way, you just—that's a meal in itself. That's yep. grab your bottle of wine, your meal simple, and you're out the door. Most like, definitely, yeah. Fingerling potatoes, asparagus, garlic butter. I mean, you look like a hero. That's all I got to say. And we've already done the work for you. You're literally just open up a bottle of wine, get it going. Meal's ready, done and done. Love it. Awesome, awesome. Any other possible questions for me so far? We got. I th you've been a, a master. You have like <laughs> we have been able to keep all the questions concise. You, I think you got to everybody's thing. Uh, everybody enjoyed it. So yeah, kudos. Thanks for letting me uh, me hang out with you on the on the 
Of course. Get to the wine. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a great education. Most definitely. Look forward to doing this again. I will be doing this again next week as well. But before then, uh, we are going to have this next, uh, excuse me, this Saturday the 12th. Chef Charlotte will be here at 10 a.m. to do a baking class for the kiddos. So, you know, they get a little bit of time just like we get a little bit of time. So uh, we like to balance things out, which is always fun. HB is definitely family friendly, as you know. So make sure everybody's taken care of. And yeah, That's always right. glad to have you guys. Chef Scott, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Yes, indeed. It, was, it was absolutely my pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well, I will see you all again soon. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. We have a New Year's coming up soon. So cheers. Cheers.